Hey guys, Drifter here. Today I want to tell you why I believe that the world is ending. And to be clear, it's probably not going to be anytime soon. I'm still personally planning to live to be an old man, but I believe that the path we're on does lead to destruction and the world is slowly coming to an end. I'm not going to try to change your mind about it today. I'm not going to come in here with the guy with the facts and figures and hit you with the logic and make you believe things that you don't want to believe. Rather, I just want to explain why I believe this and why I feel the way that I do and hope that it helps some of you understand me and others like me a little bit better. Long story short here is that I believe planet Earth is headed toward an environmental collapse because of human activity. And I don't mean global warming. We're not really going to talk about global warming or climate change today. That's kind of a hot button issue that just makes people angry and turns their brains off. I believe that we have massive problems on the way regardless of how hot or how cold the planet gets. We've got huge environmental problems that don't have anything to do with temperature. And I also believe that we're not managing the environmental resources that we have very well, or in many cases, not at all. And to be clear, I'm not talking about hippy dippy tree hugging stuff here. I am talking about base land conservation and conservation of wildlife resources. I know that right now I probably look like the poster child for left-wing cuckolding enthusiasts that has never lived outside of the city. That couldn't be further from the truth. I grew up in the Mississippi Delta and in North Texas in rural areas. I lived and worked on farms and hunted. I fished. I was really raised and taught by more Duck Dynasty kind of people. I was raised on leaving nature cleaner than when you found it, not shooting pregnant animals, not over hunting, not over fishing, don't throw your beer cans to the bottom of the lake kind of stuff. And that really stuck with me. And it's very sad to see that we can't apply those same basic principles that I learned about, you know, conserving your land to the greater population. And it, it kind of spirals out of control. But let's, let's take a step back and let's talk about why I believe the whole world is coming to an end. And I want to start with the oceans. We're not going to talk about the land. We're going to talk about the oceans. Number one, phytoplankton is declining. You know, we're not talking about plankton from SpongeBob. It's probably the plankton you're most familiar with. Rather, these little guys, phytoplankton, are microscopic plants that live in the oceans and they photosynthesize. That's why they're phyto, they photosynthesize. They're basically, they're basically plant microbes, right? You don't really see them because unless they turn into a green or red tide or something, they're not really visible. They're just very, very small. However, their numbers do add up quite dramatically. Depending on which research you're looking at, phytoplankton produce roughly about as much oxygen as all the trees and plant matter on the land. So if you think about the people that cry about the rainforest and cutting down trees and grass and plants, phytoplankton are literally equally as important. The problem is that phytoplankton populations are declining. It's not a flat across the board. Some populations went up, some went down, some changed a little bit. But the most commonly cited paper says that global phytoplankton populations have declined roughly 40% since 1950. I've seen studies saying as little as 10% phytoplankton decline, 1% per year. I've seen, well, this region is losing and this region is gaining, and it's a little bit hard to tell what. But outside of the whole carbon sink global warming thing that I don't really want to get into today, phytoplankton are kind of the basis of the food chain for all of life in the ocean. When their population declines, pretty much all other ocean population and fish species have to decline in some capacity too, or a new species has to arrive as a takeover, but that creates a lot of imbalance, right? If you're gonna look at this long-term, oceans are probably more important to the environment than life on land in the long-term at least, and they're definitely bigger than all of the life on land and sad pandas and stuff that you're gonna think about. So when the phytoplankton population collapses or undergoes a massive decline, that kind of throws a monkey wrench into the entire food chain of the ocean, which to me is a very scary thing and it signs, it signals that something bad is coming in the future. In a similar way, Coral reefs are also on the decline. Coral reefs are kind of like the rainforest of the ocean. These little things are just teeming with all sorts of rare and exotic marine life. They're a super important part of the oceanic food chain. They do stuff with oxygen and carbon, which again, we're not supposed to talk about today. But coral reefs are kind of going bye-bye. As an example, Australia's Great Barrier Reef has lost 50% of its coral since 1995, and a lot of local scientists kind of believe that it's unsavable. 
U.S. coral reefs off of Florida are suffering similar problems. Not as bad yet. Those are still seemingly savable, but the trend is quite bad. If you look at coral reefs around the world, the coral reefs are dying. There are some doom and gloom predictions out there that you can read that indicate no coral left by 2050, but at the very least, by the time 2050 gets here, coral reef will be significantly declined from where it is now. And you'd ask, well, why? Uh, the most common reason is warmer waters, again, because global warming that we're not going to talk about today. But even if you just totally discount water temperature changing and just ignore that entirely, especially off in uh, Australia and off the coast of Florida, the coral reefs are dying because of a variety of agricultural pollutants, offshore fracking, uh, ocean acidification is a big one that primarily has to do with sediment that comes from our pollution that goes back into the ocean when it rains. And oddly sunscreen from tourists that swim around the, I think it's oxybenzone if I remember the chemical correctly, kills coral. If you touch coral, it dies. You go swimming covered in sunscreen, the coral's gonna die. So the coral is facing massive problems outside of global warming. Losing coral reefs would also be a massive loss to biodiversity and the oceanic food chain in general, which could have unknown consequences for marine life in the ocean. Since we're still talking about marine life in the ocean, let's talk about overfishing, which is a huge problem. We, as in human beings around the world, are overfishing the oceans to a pretty absurd degree. China and Japan have been especially bad about this. Japan is famous for still whaling, uh, kind of with Norway, they still whale for cultural reasons and research. China is just overfishing like mad to feed their booming population that have a higher standard of living now. And these two countries actually seem to be poised for military conflict with each other over fishing rights. Same with a lot of uh, Southeast Asian countries. But it's easy to blame the Asian populations for this when in reality the European Union, the really like left-wing, totally progressive, modern, organized society, just rubber stamps overfishing year after year after year and they're, they're overfishing perhaps worse than the Chinese. So does the US, so does Canada, so does South America. Every country allows overfishing because it's extremely profitable, because you need votes from the fishermen, because you don't want to collapse the economy, because you don't want to be responsible for the food prices going up. And every year, scientists come and present and say, hey, these fish populations are in critical status. We need to conserve this, blah, blah, blah. And every year, the politicians are like, yeah, but I like cheap fish. And that's kind of what happens. So it can definitely lead to population collapses and has done that in the past and will do that in the future. At a point, it could be perhaps a disastrous one. Then you got to consider the fact that when you're fishing, we don't even eat all the animals we catch. There's a ton of animals that we catch, especially in like trawler nets, like dolphins and tuna nets and stuff like that, that we just chunk, that we just kill, that we catch for no reason. It's very wasteful. And this is another biodiversity problem. It's a very simple, it's literally like overfishing a pond if you live in the south or overfishing a river because if you catch too many fish the population goes down and sometimes it collapses. So it shows that at the very least we're not managing our ocean resources very well at all and at some point it's going to hit a critical uh, critical failure in the future I would call it. And now let's talk about the land where we live. Number one on the land is the easy one to pick on is deforestation. In the last 150 years we've cut down just under half of all trees. The number is 46 percent if I can recall that from memory here. Europe has already lost most of its old growth forest. There's not a lot left there. The easy one is right now in Brazil. Brazilians are chopping down the rainforest. Rainforest deforestation is like half a percent per year and accelerating and it's projected to be about 30% cut down by 2030 which is scary because the theoretical tipping point for desertification or forest shrinkage is around 25%. So once we've cut down about 25% of the rainforest, in theory at least, there may be no recovering it, at least not naturally. It may not just come back on its own. It may actually get smaller over time and in turn into a desert. Now this is scary for me because this area is kind of like the lungs of the planet that manages a lot of our... Uh, oxygen and carbon regulation that isn't happening in the ocean. It's also an area that's just teeming with like rare wildlife, exotic animals, just tons of life in general. It is a it is a gem. It is a natural resource, a gift from the gods, the Garden of Eden in a sense. And that 30% cut down rate is only going to get replaced by cheap cattle farms so that Americans can have inexpensive meat and burgers or realistically Brazilians, but that still lowers the overall 
price of the market globally, but they're just cutting down trees and putting in the cheapest, most efficient farms that we can. So now I have to talk about industrial farming and livestock farming, which is technically industrial livestocking, but I call it industrial, I call it livestock farming because it's, it's so horrible it doesn't feel like these animals really live as much as they are farmed just for their meat when you think about a farm you probably think about a farmer and his chickens and his hens and you know riding the tractor and the overalls and the little happy family out there but the vast majority of the food that we eat, at least in the developed world, isn't Old McDonald's Happy Farm. Farms these days tend to be extremely large, efficient, and highly organized machines. Some of them corporate farms. They use a met just tons of water. I said a metric ton of water. That would be fun. That's funny because it's just not even a fraction of it. They use ridiculous amounts of water, lots of pesticides, and they even strain the fertility of the ground that they farm on. That's why the government has these ridiculous subsidies where we pay farmers not to farm so they don't totally destroy the ground because that's kind of what was happening before. And this is why our food in the Western world is so incredibly cheap and why we produce enough to feed the world right now is because of these hyper-efficient farms. However, they're efficient in terms of cost. They're not really efficient in terms of overall resource consumption because the resources are relatively cheap. If you think that farms don't use a lot of water, you should talk to Californians. The farms in California are using a ridiculous amount of the water and it's one of the reasons that they're undergoing water conservation at the moment because the state grows so much of the food that we eat, they need so much of the water. And there's, it's, it's even worse if you want to go purely like organic farming, that's even less efficient, but with the same kind of pollutions in most cases. So organic farming is a totally different nightmare that deserves its own video, really. And if you don't like farming, my God, cattle farming and meat farms and chicken farms are truly the stuff of nightmares. These are dirty, filthy, nasty, crowded uh, pens for cattle and pigs. You know, it's usually cages for pigs these days like sort of like barns or like overhangs or like sheds for chickens that never see the light of day. The cows get pumped with hormones, antibiotics, corn fed food to make them super fat and retain water, salty food so they can pump up the price. And they just pump all sorts of stuff into these animals. Meat, if I'm not mistaken, depending on the type of meat, takes roughly 40 times the amount of water and food resources to produce than vegetables, which are already somewhat of a strain on our system. It's also a breeding ground for antibiotic resistance because the cows are given antibiotics and they become increasingly resistant to it. In the US, it's highly regulated. We had some issues in China where people were getting extremely powerful experimental antibiotics and overusing them in order to create uh, increase their cattle profits because they wouldn't have any losses. And then all of a sudden they have bacteria that's resistant to those super fancy antibiotics and they're no longer useful on people. It breeds prion diseases. I mean, if you think about it, most of the chicken that you eat today, and I know you guys eat a lot of chicken, that's the most popular meat in the world. Most of the chicken that you're eating, perhaps even right now while watching this video, lived its entire life in a dark shed, never seeing sunlight, wings clipped, feet so weak, so disabled that it could barely walk or move around, had its beak ripped out once or twice a day. They shove a tube down its throat and pump it full of corn and steroids and God knows what to fatten it up. They even bred it so that its life cycle is shorter. It doesn't mature, it doesn't live, it thinks it just grows the fattiest meat that it can. And in, in an environment that's so toxic, a lot of times the workers have to wear masks because it's just difficult to breathe in there, covered in its own poop. And then they just get a machine that goes through like a lawnmower and just sucks up all the chickens and spits them out for processing. And that's what you're eating. And you're nobody should be eating it, but it's all the chicken that we have these days because it's so efficient. This type of meat farming and industrial farming is absolutely unsustainable. Nobody on the planet that works in this industry will tell you that this is a sustainable practice that we can do until the end of time. So why do we do it? Well, the number one option is that it's cheap, it's profitable, we do a lot of bad things for money. But the other reason is, uh, from a governmental policy standpoint, is that this type of farming is why our food prices are so low. Even though we're having a supply shortage now and food prices are going up, historically they're at an all-time low. Food supply around the world is doing better than it has been in like forever probably. We have enough food to feed the entire world at a relatively low cost, which is something that humanity hasn't ever been able to be to do before but it's coming at the cost of our environment. So when it comes to deciding to farm more organically or less efficiently or consume less resources or pollute less, you're effectively asking, well, how much do you want food to cost and how many people do you wanna die when you make that decision? 
So on the topic of farming, let's talk about insect population decline, primarily from pesticides. Remember those pesticides I mentioned very briefly a few pages back? Well, insect populations are down because of that. There was the famous windshield study in Germany where they noticed that there were less bugs splattering the windshield. And then they did a, a local, I believe it was an insect biomass test. And in Germany, they predicted about an 80% decline in insect species. Thankfully, this was later debunked and it's not true. It's a little bit more doom and gloom. There are better and more recent studies that are showing that we're losing maybe 10% per decade of certain insect species, but then other insect species are gaining population eight, nine, 10% per decade, something like that. There's variability here, 1% per decade, but the general trend is that overall insect biomass is kind of going down and it's changing the portion of bugs relatively quickly. So a radical shift in insect population, both in its total number and its composition, is very scary to me because these little guys are the very base of the food chain for pretty much all life on Earth, at least all predatory life. You've got plants and bugs. That's what the lowest animals eat. That's the base of the food chain. And while the bugs are doing something weird, and that's scary to me. Changing this up really fast can have unintended consequences for land mammals, for birds, lizards, and almost everything else in the terrestrial food chain, which I am a part of. If you don't believe me, you can just think for a moment, for those of you that are older, I'm gonna say for those of you that are perhaps 30 to 40 years old, how many insects do you see now compared to when you were a kid? How many fireflies do you see in the summer? Little lightning bugs that just pop, those little beetles that have glowing uh, butts. I used to see a ton of them as a kid. They're super rare for me now. I used to see a lot of butterflies as a kid. I don't see them anymore. My grandparents, when I would grow up, I would go outside and it would just be covered in fireflies and stuff. And I'd catch them and I'd put them in a little glass jar, mesh top so they don't die. And you know, it's use, use it to like see in the dark. It was amazing. And my grandparents would always complain about how few lightning bugs there were this year, just how few of these little glowing insects were around. And I thought there were a ton. And there's even less than that now. You can literally see this trend generationally for those of you that are old enough. Or when was the last time you saw a whole horde of butterflies? Those things used to be everywhere. What's the primary cause of this? Simple version is pesticides. We farm a lot. We pump a ton of pesticides into the environment with the farms. It ends up in the water. It ends up places it shouldn't be. Some people just pollute inappropriately with it. We put pesticides all over our house to keep out a number of pest species of insects that ultimately kills all insects. And it's leading to really weird changes in our insect population, which should be very scary to all of you. This is the base of our food chain, guys, and nobody seems to care. Let me go through the next couple really quickly here. There's a decrease in the population of freshwater migratory fish. That's anything that swims up and downstream depending on the time of year. And freshwater fish species in general are very slightly on the decline. I imagine that's gonna get worse in the future. So even the fish not in the ocean are having their problems. There is a generalized decrease in freshwater supply, like drinking water for me and you, uh, all around the world. Now this one is very regionalized. Some, some regions are doing totally fine. Some are doing way worse than others. But it's sort of a big picture aggregate here. We're seeing less and less fresh water and there are projected fresh water shortages anywhere between 2030 to 2050, depending on which doom and gloom prophecy you want to believe in. But that's another problem. And it probably doesn't help that a lot of our rivers and lakes look kind of like this. Uh, this is a third world problem. It's ridiculously polluted. But even in the Western world, we have lakes that are radiated or filled with lead or polonium or just littered with beer cans at the bottom. Our fresh water is getting screwed up too. I remember when I was a, literally as a kid growing up in a rural region of the United States, almost every lake or public land would have giant signs saying, do not eat the fish because of XYZ pollution, it was poisonous. And the really poor people in that area, which is sometimes my family, had to eat it anyway just to live. And that shouldn't be that way. Our fresh water in a rural area far away from any pollutants shouldn't be so toxic that you can't eat the fish. That's all the non-global warming things that kind of keep me awake at night. We can throw global warming into this mix for, you know, just jokes. I don't really care if you believe in it or not. I'm kind of tired of debating people to the end of time. Uh, climate change at the very least can be said to have contributed to some of these problems. However, for reasons that I've clarified, I believe we have plenty enough pollutants and poor resource management strategies 
where we would still have really big changes, even if global warming was a total lie, even if literally Satan himself whispered global warming into Al Gore's ear to make it a big deal and steal money from people and screw up the world and use it as a control, and it was literally totally bogus and the earth is totally fine temperature-wise, we've still got massive problems with the pollutants we put out, the, con the effects they have, and how we're managing our resources. So based on this, you would think that we human beings and intelligent species would see this and say, okay, that's kind of scary. You know, our biodiversity, our food chain is, you know, changing really fast and this can lead to like mass starvation and planetary changes that we can't really control. We should get together and do something about this, right? We're kind of doing the opposite. We are for the most part ignoring the problems and in many cases kind of doubling down on the pollution, the pollutants, where we can and can't do things. Even the majority of recycling now is a scam. To think that companies primarily responsible for the pollution that's killing this world are also the companies responsible for promoting those little like rainforest magazines and anti-pollution campaigns and plastic recycling things that you saw in school as a kid as a sort of design to control the narrative, shift the blame to you. And in many cases, something like plastic recycling is basically a scam. There's like 12 types of plastic. I think only one or two types are recyclable. And the company that manages that is managed by a plastics manufacturing trade organization. And they chose the logo for the recycling numbers one to 12 to be nearly identical to the then universal recycling logo so that when people look at it, they just assume it's recyclable and chunk it in the recycling bin when that's not really the case. And even the plastic that is recyclable, we just ship it to China on a boat that burns crude oil out in the ocean. They do God knows what to it, not only with the human rights standpoint, but a fuel usage, turn it into some cheap product and then ship it back over here. So that's totally screwed up. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being negative here, but there's a lot of types of recycling I'm not a fan of. Uh, some, some types are great, plastic isn't one of them. So there's basically two simple problems causing all of these symptoms that we're facing. Number one is that there are simply too many people on the planet. There are too many human beings living today. Our population is too big. It's not sustainable. You can all tell me I'm a horrible person. I don't know what I'm talking about, but that's just facts. There's too many of us to live. And number two is that we're not managing the land and water resources that we have. Again, I'm not talking about hippy dippy stuff where we all live in like wigwams out in the forest and wear tie dye shirts and give the tree a hug in the morning and eat pine cones. I'm talking about basic resource conservation stuff that I learned as a kid hunting, fishing, don't fish all the fish out of the pond, there won't be any next year, don't kill the pregnant animals, there won't be any next year, don't throw your beer cans into the water because it can do God knows what. These kind of things that I learned are not being applied to our large scale populations and there are massive consequences for ignoring these kind of basic rules. So because of all of this, I believe that the world is ending. I believe that at some point in the future, it may be 10, 20, realistically, probably 30 to 40 years, probably when I'm elderly, that there will be a massive environmental collapse. Uh, we will struggle for resources, meat, food, water, stuff like that will become incredibly expensive. Us here in the first world, we don't have to worry about it too much because of our relative wealth and positioning and the way we manage our resources. We're going to be good for a long time. However, a lot of countries in develop, a lot of, and I was going to say the third world, but we'll use developing countries, it's a little bit more polite. They don't have this luxury, and they're also going to be the most impacted by all of these environmental changes. So if America's having a crisis because 200,000 Mexicans came across the border, imagine what it's going to be like when all of the ecosystems in South America collapse and like 100 million people want to flood across the border. Or imagine what it's going to be like. It's going to be an absolute disaster. Hell, even, even literally there's a theory that says that uh, climate change created ISIS because ISIS was born out of a instability in the local government that allowed the radicals to take over because they couldn't feed their population because there wasn't enough bread because climate change because of the drought, blah, blah, blah. But the point is that the societal changes that this is going to cause are probably going to be more immediately visible than the environmental ones for us. And it's going to be really hard. And it's going to separate the haves and haves nots. The poor people in the United States today are complaining about rent being too high and having too many bills and not being able to save up for the future. 30, 40 years from now, the poor people in the United States are going to be complaining about not having enough water, not having enough food to live. That's what I think. That's what I believe. I don't know what my retirement plan is going to be like in the future. I'm going to be quite frank with all of you that my wife and I, at least for the time being, have decided not to have children because we don't want to uh, 
have a child born and have to raise it into a world that will inevitably lead to ruin and hardship and suffering. And I don't know if they'll be able to if my predictions are wrong and things come faster. And I don't even know if it's worth it to save money for retirement because about the time I get that old, it may not be good for anything anymore. I've said on stream and I'll say it here again, uh, that we, our general retirement plan is to kill ourselves before this gets too bad. I'll probably kill her and then do myself, but the general plan for our retirement is if any of these predictions come true and we have this environmental and societal collapse, I will be too old to deal with it. Instead of getting scavenged or beaten or abused or something or just starving to death, that we will just end ourselves in the most painless way possible. That's what I believe, that's how I feel, that's how I live my life. That's one of the reasons I YOLO so many things. That's one of the reasons I seem indifferent and uncaring is because I realize that a lot of the things that I'm working on and trying to build and care for just may not matter in the future whatsoever. So now that we're done with the doom and gloom, let's talk about a couple of solutions to this problem that are immediately available and a little bit of self-criticism here. So there are three solutions that I can think of off the top of my head that are immediately viable. Number one is the Thanos solution. Uh, Thanos effectively committed a G word that I cannot say here on YouTube or I will get demonetized. But that solution would work. Massively reducing the human population would solve our problems, at least temporarily, though I think 50% is a bit uh, kind on that. We're probably going to need more than 50% to stabilize this ship. And more generously, more kindly than a horrible, nasty G word, we could enact strict population limits to decrease our population over time into the future, but that may not be extreme enough. And it also kind of goes against a lot of fundamental human rights and human biology and desire to reproduce. So that's kind of a tough one in and of itself. You could run into a problem where you have a much larger aging, older population that's unhealthy and a younger population that's too small to care for them. Japan and China are having this problem at the moment. Number two is a, I guess, guess possible one. It's a radical change in our laws, society, economics, everything. I mean, if we were to take this lesson to heart and we radically changed how we thought about and regulated pollution, how we thought about and regulated human consumption, lifestyle, land management, efficiency, personal choice, and just a lot of freedoms in general, we probably could force society on a path, even at our current population, that would be more sustainable or kick this problem another 100 or 200 years down the line into the future. However, choosing this path is effectively like an extremely totalitarian government that tells you how to live your life. You don't have choices. You can't buy things. You can't enjoy things. We would all have to accept significantly less in our life. We would all have to just say, okay, I can do with a whole lot less than what I have now. I don't want any more. I don't need that or just be forced to that. And that goes against my personal morals and beliefs about freedom and choice and human happiness. And these options just also generally don't go well with human biology or nature. We are creatures of infinite want and consumption. We're intelligent beings that always know that there's something better out there. So we want something that's a bit nicer, a bit more than the other person, a bit bigger, a bit more tasty, a bit longer lasting, etc., etc. We also value our social bonds and each other. Uh, we don't like turning on each other or killing each other, at least our own in-groups. I know that the out-group and the other group and the people you don't like is an entirely different psychological problem for a different video. But in general, we don't turn on family members. We don't turn on neighbors. We don't turn on friends. We do embrace our social structures and stick to them even to a fault. So how would you as a parent tell your child that they're just gonna have to accept less in the future because your generation or the ones before you just consumed too much? Your child grows up and they're like, wow, you know, daddy, mommy, you guys had it great in the past. You had all this stuff, why don't I get this? And like, well, son, we used it all. Now you're not allowed to have any or the whole world will end. Or even as a parent, you always wanna do what's best for your child. You wanna bring that child up in a better, nicer, happier environment than what you had and give them more opportunity than what you had, which in many cases means more stuff. And how would you feel about somebody else telling you that your child has to have less than you? That by law or by command of some higher power that you must deny these things to your child, you would rebel against that almost certainly. It goes against our very biology and the same kind of thing is happening with third world countries right now. You can look at India and China and they're kind of of the opinion that Western powers invented all of this stuff. They polluted, they half ruined the planet. They're trying to play catch up. And now the Western powers are like, oh no, please don't pollute India. India, please don't pump all these toxins into the river. It's bad for the world. 
but the government and ruling party there has to provide a higher standard of living for its people than they had in the past, and they're not willing to accept that the people who consumed all the stuff anyway now get to tell them they can't have anything or the whole world ends. So we're just kind of playing games with hand grenades. So yeah, that's scary. And then at the very end is a little light of hope in this very gloomy kind of video. It's sort of uh, the most common solution or most common criticism that I get from people other than the basic, well, these problems aren't real. It's that my solution sort of denies hope. There is a hope that in the future there is a new energy source that is radically different and better than what we had before. It could be solar, it could be nuclear, it could be fusion, it could be something that we didn't even think of because, you know, if we're almost doing magic compared to science 50 years ago, then 50 years from now they'll be able to do even crazier stuff, right? And that that's pretty cool and that's a, that's a fair criticism, I would say. I'm more personally of a pragmatic belief. I believe in working with the tools that I have today and not betting on a magic future technology. And people will say, well, you don't have to worry about it because when our backs are against the wall, we human beings, intelligent creatures are pretty crafty. We're pretty stubborn. We almost always find a way out of the problem. Our technology is always improving. We're getting better. When push comes to shove, shove, economics will force the human race to sort this out. When we're all dying, our resources will pull together and we'll figure this out and it'll be done. And there's also the idea that the planet is too big for us to significantly change. So what we'll do is make it uncomfortable and then we'll do some sort of technology to kind of scale it back into reason. I, I disagree on the planet being too big to change. I think detonating all of our nukes at once could definitely do that, especially in key locations. But the point is that there is a hope that in the future there will be a better solution. Perhaps a technology that cleans the oceans, saves the coral reefs, reduces the carbon so the liberals can stop crying about it, fixes our atmosphere, produces clean energy, and allows us to do a great number of things in the future without really harming the environment that we can't do today. And that's probably true. I mean, if you looked at the uh, pollution output of like, like an old like steam train that would just burn logs and pump it into the environment, it's much better now to use an electric one in most cases. Steam engine train, I should say. And we are getting more efficient and we are getting better and we're learning increasingly amazing things with science and physics. But some of those same science and physics that help make these creations also have fundamental laws like the law of thermodynamics. Uh, conser mm, conservation is not always. We're going to skip that one. That one's a little more complicated. But they seem to indicate that we're trending toward a problem and there aren't any magical solutions available now. So a solution that I have now is to consume less or to remove people, God, or to just not care and YOLO it until the end of the world. And uh, I don't know, I'm just not a big fan of the magic solution. I call it the magic solution. It's the hope solution because it, the criticism of people like me is that because of the media that we consume, which is controlled by somebody, that we are denied hope in our own future. We are instilled with a sense of doom and gloom that makes us easier to manipulate, and I don't really think that's true. If anything, it's going to make people wilder and less predictable. So at this point, I'm rambling a little bit, but I hope that you have learned something about my perspective, about how I see the world and how I believe things. And I will say at the end of the video that I don't believe these things because I want to. I don't believe these things because I feel cool thinking that I'm the guy that knows when the world is going to end when that's not true or just because I watch too much CNN. I believe these things because I believe them to be like objectively, provably, scientifically accurate and it's the best information that I've got today. If in the future the information changes, perhaps radically, I'll update my beliefs, but until then, I, I feel like we are headed toward disaster and that the world, or at least human civilization as we know it, is coming to an end. So, yeah, I uh, hope you enjoyed this video or learned something. Learned something about me at the very least. If you did, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.